Suerna, Jim, uh, Sam, thanks for joining. We'll start probably 701, 702. Um, we'll start a, a couple minutes late just to let everybody join. And um, uh, again, I'll uh, um, make sure that we introduce the entire panel. Uh, and so I'll let it, I'll, each of you introduce yourselves. Okay. And for those board introductions, let's just go through uh, sort of our seniority rotation, which would be start with Suwerna and um, end with Rahila. All right. Introductions, just like name kids, or just a brief thoughts on where we are in the process. Just um, mostly you, just identifying yourself as a board member, um, okay. I think. Yeah. Sounds good. Hi, Rahila. So uh, I noticed you just joined. So we're going to let uh, you can see the participants right now. We have 135. So we do have uh, folks who um, can see us right now. And but we're not going to start formally until another couple minutes, probably 701, 702. And okay. um, we'll just introduce the, the panel real quick. Um, but then uh, Ching Pei and I will. Um, uh, just give a real quick overview of sort of where we're at in the process and uh, talk through the draft models and the survey results. And then we'll mostly orient ourselves around listening to comments and Q&A. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, Pam, could you check in uh, with Ching Pei and make sure she's able to find the link and um, access and join? Yes. Thanks so much. That looks like a refreshing drink, Rahila. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Uh, thanks for joining us. So um, we'll uh, get started in a minute or two, and uh, we'll do a quick introduction of the who's on the panel. And then um, I'll give a little bit of orientation on the process. Ching Pei will share a little bit our current thinking on um, uh, draft models and survey results. And then we'll orient mostly around comments and Q&A. Um, Amy, are you able to hear us? Yeah. Okay, super. Just checking. Okay. We'll get started in um, just a minute. I see that we still have uh, participants uh, joining at a pretty good clip. So we'll probably just give it one more minute and, and start uh, uh, around 7 or 2, 02 or so.
Okay, um, why don't we get going? Um, Pam, if there are questions that come in uh, that you have ready answers to, you're welcome to um, uh, respond. And Jerome, you pointed out that if we do uh, surpass uh, 500 um, uh, observers that we may need to um, direct people to the uh, YouTube uh, live streaming, is that correct? Yes, it's uh, posted on the website. There's a little box there where they can click on it and go to the um, page that has the Zoom information, meeting information, and also the link to the YouTube live stream. So if they're not planning on asking a question, um, the YouTube live stream will have everything that's on here. Super. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh, but the folks who um, will only be able to take uh, comments and questions from the, from the participants in the webinar. Uh, yes, from the okay. From Got it. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, we do have this in a webinar format so that we can um, hopefully control the audio quality a little bit, uh, uh, make sure that we don't have too much background noise. Um, but we will uh, have um, people's ability uh, later on to give comments uh, directly um, via audio. And, but people can also send in questions via, via the Q&A function. So th thank you. This is the Belmont Redwood Shores uh, Town Hall uh, on the topic of our um, hopeful reopening of schools um, in the fall. I wanna thank you for your time. I'd like to introduce uh, the folks on the panel. Uh, my name is Michael Milliken, um, Superintendent. Uh, Chingpei, maybe we can go to you and do staff and then uh, to Suwerna and the board. Hi, I'm Ching Pai Hu. I'm Assistant Edu uh, Superintendent of Educational Services. Good evening, everybody. My name is Suwarna Bhopali. I'm the board president. I'm glad to see we're at nearly 430 uh, participants uh, tonight. Hi, I'm Amy Koo, and I'm vice president of the school board. Okay, off meet now. Hi, I'm Sam Leinbach and I am clerk of the board. Yeah, I'm Jim Howard, I'm a, a school board member. Hi, this is Rahila Lapassi, I'm a board member as well. Wonderful. And then the other panelists you see, the BRSSD YouTube is for streaming purposes. Uh, Jerome is our director of tech, and um, Pam Hopkins is um, uh, our executive assistant who's helping uh, facilitate tonight. So again, uh, thank everyone for being here. Um, real quick, I want to go over purpose and process, then Ching Pei will go over um, our current thinking around models for school next fall, and also uh, some of the results from, or the high level results uh, from the survey that went out over the weekend. And then we'll focus on um, Q&A uh, as well as comments that people may have. Um, you can submit questions um, now via the Q&A function. Uh, um, I think it's similar to chat. Or if you want, um, you can have an opportunity to speak uh, by using the raised hand function, as I understand. And then we'll keep tabs on um, folks raising their hands and allow them to speak, we'll just ask that we try to keep it to one minute. As you can imagine, with over 400 participants, we want to just um, be respectful of everybody's time. So we do ask those speakers to try to focus um, uh, their comments. So real quick purpose. The purpose of this is to share our thinking and to get your input, um, get everyone's perspective, and um, to help uh, us spot issues and to make sure that we're aware of the nuances of, of people's uh, perspectives and thoughts that may not have been uh, picked up by surveys. Um, with regard to process, 
we are working towards by the end of the month and hopefully by um, the end of next week, uh, having a, a rough outline for how we want to um, try to approach schooling um, in the fall with the understanding that um, all of this has, uh, will be determined by the county health orders that are in effect um, at that time in, in mid-August. Um, with regard to process, we've shared some of our thinking um, with you all via my updates uh, to the community. We've also shared them um, via board meetings. We, um, sorry, I'm getting a little distracted here. Um, we have an advisory committee that's met twice, Monday and Wednesday of this week, and then we'll meet Monday and Wednesday of next week from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, you can follow that if you want to. Um, via uh, streaming on our um, homepage. And um, folks are always welcome to write us. In addition to that survey, you can just write us at feedback at brssd.org. That will go to uh, Pam, um, Genevieve and myself. We'll also be sharing it with Ching Pei, um, also be sharing it with the board so that we make sure that um, um, your interests, your, your concerns, your questions are heard. Um, so our, our next uh, board meeting will be a week from today, um, Thursday evening, where we hope to get um, further board guidance and have a good sense of where we're at with, with the models that we're considering. Um, also, uh, what's come up in the advisory committee, um, by the way, that advisory committee is made up of parents and staff, um, primarily from our school site councils from our seven schools. So we do have some district representation, but mostly it's site-based and that committee is, is roughly 50 people. Um, with regard to the regulatory context, we don't have a complete free hand here with regard to how we um, do school in the fall. Um, we are expecting a, um, a county health order that um, will complement the county's framework that they're sharing uh, right now. Pam, if you could uh, share that via the, the chat box, um, you could share a link to the, the county's framework. That just came out in the last 24 hours. They have shared uh, the full framework. And so if you'd like to take a look, um, it's a pretty substantive document, but it outlines the constraints that we expect to have in terms of social distancing, keeping students together in stable cohorts and not having them mix. And so that does have some pretty specific implications for how we can do school in the fall. Um, the most significant of which is the social distancing, which um, will limit us to roughly 50% capacity of students at schools uh, and in, in, in classrooms at any given time. Um, the other constraints that we have are, are some of the things that we have in, in our employee agreements, um, like some class size arrangements that we have our instructional days and our work day. And so, um, you know, someone might suggest, why don't you just have an extra 60 days of school and an extra, eight, you know, uh, four hours longer in the, in the day. Um, that's something that we could bring up with our employees, but it, it isn't part of our, our current agreement. And so right now we are for the most part looking at um, a typical school day, 180 days of school and um, class size that are in that 25 to 30 range uh, for the most part. So um, with that, um, oh, and I didn't mention money, um, you know, you might say, why not just hire uh, uh, more teachers uh, in order to address the smaller class size? Well, as I've been sharing in our updates, we do have, we are facing some significant budget cuts uh, due to the recession uh, related to the pandemic, the lower state revenue. And so we are having to um, offer school in the fall um, with the same or slightly less resources than we had uh, this year. So um, with that sort of outline of the regulatory context uh, and the constraints, Ching Pei, could you share sort of our current thinking with regard to models as well as the survey results and the nuances of how people can, can um, uh, find the, the specific uh, responses to the specific questions? Yes, uh, can someone, can the host please give me sharing access? Sorry, I was in the I was responding to some questions on chat. So I'll start while we work on screen share. Here we go. Um, I'm going to talk through our models first. I'm going to give it a pretty quick breeze because I think a lot of people listened to both the board meeting earlier this week and 
Also, you've seen these slides in a short recording from the community survey that we sent out. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Sandwich BRSSD is one of, my computer is hanging, of course, is one of 23 districts in the county and we are following guidance from the county health officer, the county office of education and our state department of education. So while things are recommendations at this point, we do expect a county health order at which point the recommendations become requirements and we are not allowed to deviate. We do have to follow the curbs and boundaries that are set for us, but we can be creative within the curbs and boundaries. There are four basic pillars that the San Mateo County Office of Education is asking our school districts to pay attention to as we plan for reopening. They are health and hygiene, face coverings, physical distancing, and limited gatherings. So we need to implement new routines. We need to teach explicitly how children should be washing their hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. We need to ensure that there are daily temperature checks for both staff and students. Face coverings are going to be required of all people on campus. Um, students and staff alike. The only exemptions to those are students or staff who have respiratory challenges and students with sensory difficulties. Um, there is a little bit of guidance from the county, county Office of Education with a staggered expectation with kindergartners expecting, expected to be wearing their face coverings 25% of the school day, first graders 50% of the school day, second graders 75% of the school day, and then third graders and above are expected to wear their masks the entire time they're on school campus, in common areas, walking around the campus, and um, of course our exempt while they are eating, they need to take their masks off to have lunch. Physical distancing requires that we keep a six foot distance even within all of the classrooms. So because of the size of our classrooms, that's going to limit the number of students we can allow in any given classroom situation. There's no finite number in the stable cohorts that we're model that we're following that says you can only have 12 kids or you can only have 15 kids. What you have to do is be able to provide for enough space such that everybody has basically a 36 square foot area and they're able to stay and maintain distance between their peers and between their teacher. This is gonna be challenging because we typically have some teachers who come in and um, they come in and they teach science, they come in and they teach music or kids rotate between six different teachers over the course of the day. We are not going to be able to mix stable cohorts. We have to assign teachers to students and they need to stay together for the entirety of their day um, for, long, for, for basically the entire quarter semester year. The other piece too is limited gatherings. We can't have group gatherings, which means no in-person staff meetings, no school assemblies, um, volunteers won't be allowed on campus. We hope that we can perform a lot of our normal tasks and events through remote settings such as these. Um, we wanna capitalize on volunteers maybe on the independent study times where kids can still have access to fun extracurriculars. We're in the middle of planning right now. We finally have some guidance from the county, so we're able to give uh, you some- Ching Pei, uh, there's a little bit of static on the audio, so you might want to switch off your, um, if you switch off video, does that, does that, uh, anyway, I was trying to suggest less demand on the- Let me see if I switch off anyway. my face video, if that- There you, you go. should still be able to see my screen. Perfect. Perfect, let's do that. Okay, so we're in the middle of planning right now. So we are in the process of soliciting stakeholder input. We've put together a draft plan based off of all of the restrictions and guidelines that we are aware of. We wanna know what works for our community, our community of parents, our community of teachers, our community of students. So with the stakeholder input through advisory meetings, through this town hall, through your individual emails to us, we will revise all of our plans. Keep in mind, again, the, the kind of county and state frameworks that we have to abide by. And once we do that, the sites have time to develop very site-specific logistical plans. Drop-off is going to look different depending on which school you're at. For example, Nesbitt has both the front parking lot and a back parking lot and a lot of physical space to do the drop-off, whereas Cipriani is in the middle of a neighborhood and doesn't quite have the same physical layout. So each side has to make some local decisions to follow our And everything that we work on over the summer and decide upon and plan is subject to any adjustments from the county health officer. We are obviously going to be paying attention to that throughout the summer. But before we start school on August 19th, we will definitely adjust if there are new developments, new uh, restrictions, whether they're tightened or loosened. And parallel to all of this, we are working with our employee unions to ensure that they are part of the discussion and we abide by our collective agreements. 
I think what makes the most sense is to just stick to this one slide. Ultimately, we are looking at taking every single class grouping and splitting it in half. So whether it's a primary classroom of 25 kids or a classroom up at Ralston of 30 students, every teacher's normal roster is going to be cut into an A group and a B group. And what we're trying to figure out from the community right now is what makes sense to you. We know that the A group and the B group, even though I share the teacher, will not intermingle with one another. We know that my A group, Mrs. Hughes class, will not, even though I'm on campus at the same time as Mr. Milliken, will not intermingle. We have to keep our stable or stable to the assigned students and teacher and any other staff that are a part of that group. So if I am a child in group A and I happen to have a SCIA or a para support, um, that person is going to be assigned to my group A and stay with my class and not go and intermingle with another teacher in another class. We need to decide what makes sense. Do we alternate the AB group every other day where we say A group is always on campus Monday, Thursday, B group is always on campus Friday, and we alternate every other Wednesday. So I'm either on campus two days or three days of the week. Do we say, I want the A group on campus for five days straight, and then we have the weekend to clean and air out, and then the B group for the five days? Remember, if I go for a longer time on campus, that means I'm also going for a longer time off campus. There's also the option of a morning group where the A group is on campus every single morning and the B group is on campus every single afternoon. As you would imagine, we would need to have a lengthier lunch period. The kids wouldn't be on campus for lunch, which reduces the load for supervision and cross-pollination. However, there are a lot of logistics involved in that. And then it becomes an issue for families. Is it worth it to you trying to work at home if your child is only on campus for two and a half hours of the day, knowing you'll need to drop them off and pick them up? What we've been hearing from our advisory groups is this option doesn't seem to be the favorite at the moment. And then there's always the op option of do we do full distance learning, whether by choice or as a district. Um, we do have individual slides that show you what the schedules might look like at the elementary and the Ralston level, but I think those are in the community survey and in more detail. For the interest of time, we want to make sure you have the option to ask questions. I'm going to switch over right now to um, Ching, survey Perry, one, Yeah, let me, um, if you could go back to that, uh, that last uh, point was, it said, or uh, full or complete distance learning. I just want to reiterate for uh, the community that we do seem to have about 20% of our families that um, either by medical necessity or preference um, uh, have indicated uh, that they want um, distance learning. And we do have a similar percentage of our staff that are interested in distance learning. Um, so there is a, um, we are actively pursuing an either or model where your family could participate in the in-person program or the distance learning program. Um, the distance learning program would be um, fully um, online or, or, or via video conference or, or, or distance learning um, methodologies. And so we just wanna let people know that currently we're pursuing both uh, an in-person program and a distance learning program for um, families and staff to hopefully uh, choose from. Chingpei, please continue. I apologize for interrupting. Sure, not at all. I'm going to now switch over to show you preliminary data from our um, surveys, just so everyone can see. Okay, share screen, select. Okay, so we have really great participation. Uh, clearly, this is something people are interested in. In all the LCAP surveys I've done, I've never gotten more than 200 people and it's taken multiple reminders. We're currently pushing 1,700 respondents. When these slides are put together, 1,600, I will update the information, but I did quick peek before running, and none of the overall percentages have really swayed one way or the other. You can see we have participation from every single one of our every single one of our sites. We have participation from every single one of our grade levels. We have parents of various special populations that we pay careful attention to in our planning. And 
we have about 14, 15% of our families who also have students at Carl Mott and or um, any one of the Sequoia Union High School districts. This helps us understand to what degree we need to be in alignment with the high school district. We ask the families about their comfort level to school. I understand that these are cut off. We, these are pulled from the Google slides. Um, so what I've done is I put into the notes what all of these missing sentences or truncated sentences actually are. I asked families what they would be comfortable with. And because families could choose more than one response, you'll see that the total number here adds up to more than the 1600 respondents. But ultimately the vast majority of our families are comfortable with having students come in person or to a blend of in-person and distance learning. We have about 18.8% in this question saying that they prefer the option of full distance learning. And we have a number of families who aren't comfortable with any of the options. This graph here tells, this pie chart shows just relative comfort level. So it looks about 68% of our families are relatively very comfortable sending students to school, understanding that we will have social distancing and all of the other kind of parameters that we've discussed. And this is the one that I think, this is what Michael was referring to a second ago, about 78% of our families will plan to send their child to school, but we have a good 22% who say they're not going to send their child to school with even with our precautions. The next set of questions that I clumped together for pre presenting to you is general sense of need. Um, this one is about child care. We wanted to get a sense of what the child care needs were. We understand that our local child care providers will be working with families on sliding scales for those who need the support. We unfortunately are not a district that has the financial capacity to say, we'll subsidize and we'll make it work. So we didn't want to put in an option that we couldn't respond to in terms of that fit choice of, I need help. Um, we do know that people need help and, and we will do our best to put you in touch with, with the right people. We just, as a district, can't respond to that. Um, we asked about technology. It's, it, it's nice to see that 70% of our families will basically have enough technology for each child. Um, I look at this and even though it's split into who needs help with the district providing, who's sharing with their child, who's sitting sharing, if we are to go into full distance learning, I look at this as 30% of our population needs the district to support you because we want to make sure all of the students have the dice devices they need to be able to access any learning. And then these were the kind of four behaviors that we wanted to get a sense from the community. Not only where are you on your comfort in preparing a child, but also giving you a heads up that these are likely going to be requirements for coming to school based off of the county health orders. Wearing a face covering. I know that I've been sending my own children out to take walks with me with a dog. And even in our neighborhood, we wear masks. Um, social distancing, the idea that our students can't hang out in large groups and have to get used to being six feet away from their peers is something that we should be practicing. Um, washing hands for 20 seconds, right? My second grade daughters teach them how to sing multiple songs while they're washing their hands so they could choose when they liked. And then daily temperature checks. That's obviously something that's not something we've ever done for children coming to school. It'll be different. This is a very small text, but I just wanted to give you a sense just big picture, there are a number of concerns we asked you about. Some are a great concern to the overall population and some are a very little concern to the overall population. We understand that for the vast majority of our families, security of lunch is not an issue, but for those for whom it is, it is a big issue. So that's not something that we're gonna drop simply because it's not an issue for most families. And I wanted to make that clear for anybody who is in this population here um, who needs our support. But, you know, the, the couple things that stood out to us, I think that because they're a little bit different from staff perception from the conversations we've had. Families generally are not concerned with online misbehavior by students. Families are also generally not concerned with student data privacy, whereas our staff are very concerned with both of those. We also polled our staff. They have a little bit of a different set of questions just because the circumstances are a little bit different. We asked them about a couple of things that they're concerned with coming to campus in terms of social distancing between the students and staff and washing physical space at work. And you can see where that falls. We um, asked the same four kind of components of how prepared are you? And then here's where Michael was referring to, we have a percentage of staff who also are not comfortable coming back to work. A little slightly higher than the community participation. Um, when we look at what schedule works for you guys as a community, 
I asked you to rank. Um, would it be preferable for you to have a fixed schedule where you're on three days, one week and two days the next? So Monday, Thursday with the alternating Wednesday or Tuesday, Friday with an alternating Wednesday? That's this option here. This was every um, other week where I would be at school a week and at home a week. Um, this was, I would be at school in the morning and home in the afternoon and or vice versa. And this option is for full distance learning at the elementary level. Um, it's interesting to see that a large percentage of the families are not at all interested in full distance learning in the primary grades. As you look through, you'll see the distribution changes a little depending on the grade level. This is for 6-8 at Nesbitt and Sandpiper. Still pretty high where people are not interested in full distance learning, but then you can see uh, the two five-day models seem to work a little bit better. And then this is for Ralston. I had a couple of questions about the student ad asking us which model we wanted you to choose. And that was intentional. I want We want to understand what schedule works best for you and we want to understand your preferences. We didn't put specific models because those are conceptual thoughts and they are changing as we get feedback from the advisory committee. So if we look at the schedules here, there's still most folks not interested in full distance learning. And that matches what we saw earlier where there were about 20% that were interested in full distance learning. Um, but only if absolutely necessary, I can make it work or this sounds great. It's all fairly even. It looks like these two options where it's three days on, two days off, or um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, this week, Tuesday, Thursday, next week, and then rotating Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday. It's just a slightly different variation of the every other day. And then for the priorities, what stands out to us when we look at this from a staff perspective is um, just the number of families who felt like getting the most time with core academics was more important to them than saying students getting the elective of their choice or students having access to all of their teachers um, across the day. This compares um, on the left, the staff responses and to, on the right, the community responses. This was the question around which learning strategies did your students engage in? And so the same thing happens here on the Google slides. Every other option is spelled out and they're still truncated. So in the notes section below, I've written everything out, but it goes from live meetings to recorded sessions, established virtual office hours and goes down. The thing to pay attention to, and I think it's interesting, is even though the options on the left axis are exactly the same, the experience for the students is different from the experience of the teachers. A lot of teachers are trying a lot of different things, and you can see the variation here in who did what, but the what the child experienced is, um, it, uh, it's not sorted. It seems like I sorted it to go from top to bottom, most to least, but it just so happens that the first choice was the most experienced, which is good, live synchronous learning. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Um, this one, I, again, the text is very small, so down below should be written out. This asked about efficacy of these strategies that you just experienced, what was the most useful? So again, going left to right in matches, going from top to bottom, the live synchronous lessons, the pre-recorded lessons, the office hours, et cetera. The, the thing to pay attention to at a high level here is the distribution of very effective and effective for staff across the top bar and for community across the bottom bar to see where the alignment are in terms of live synchronous learning was effective to most, very effective for most people um, to you know all the different things, recorded lessons, um, opportunities to engage in projects, communicating with the family, group group projects, flexibility of schedule. This seemed very effective to the teachers and for the families, maybe a little bit less obviously flexible, which is important to know because teachers I think thought that they were doing families a favor and families maybe thought, oh, this isn't the greatest. Um, this is the distance learning tools, the tech tools our teachers have access to. There were a variety of tools from things that were district supported to things that teachers found on their own, thanks to kind of the global COVID-19, many, many companies made their platforms free, which gave us the opportunity to pilot a lot. Um, again, you can see the alignment between use for teacher versus use by student. 
Um, so that helps us understand what was used. And the next slide helps us understand what was effective. Again, let's pay attention to kind of the arc of what was effective. Teachers thought Google Classroom was a really great way to share. Families were a little bit more mixed bag about that. Some didn't even experience it. Um, clever, teachers didn't think it was maybe that effective, but families thought it was a good tool in one way or the other. And so this is gonna help us understand what training we need to provide and what tools we need to provide for our teaching staff. That is a quick summary of the data that we have thus far. Thanks, Xing Pei. Um, we'll, uh, uh, at this point, um, just want to uh, thank you for, for your planning. Um, I've been sc scanning the uh, Q&A and would like to take just um, a few minutes to speak to some of the topics. Um, people asked about childcare. Um, if we're on an AB schedule, um, my expectation is that we will not be able to provide or have footsteps provide or any of our um, child care partners provide, um, at least on our sites, um, child care for students on their off day. So um, we may be able to have um, the cohorts of two classes um, merge and, and go with a single um, teacher in childcare, um, or we could potentially group students by their after school plans um, and you know have a, a, a group of students who plan to go to childcare together. But we're in the early stages of coordinating with Footsteps, the um, Sandpiper program, as well as the programs at Fox and Central um, and around the district. So we do hope to be able to partner with those organizations and continue to provide um, some after-school child care on the students on day, right? If they're an A student on the A days, um, but not on the other days. And so we do realize that this uh, would have an impact on, on families that rely on those programs because now suddenly your child's um, even on their off day uh, might not have access to their normal child care program um, afterwards, uh, or their normal child care program. Um, other topics uh, that were brought up um, were potentially friend pairings. Could we um, put students uh, together in classes, at least with uh, one or two friends, uh, to help with um, the social uh, challenges of this? We will do our best. Um, it would be very helpful if uh, you're, you know, if you have a last name in the first half of the alphabet, if your friends uh, have out, uh, last names in the first uh, half, of, half of the alphabet, um, that would help us because right now, just in order to keep families together on A and B schedules, you can imagine we're, you know, one of the first ways of cutting um, the population into A and B is by last name by family in order to keep families together. Um, people asked about after school programs like sports and clubs right now. Uh, we are not um, planning to offer those at this time. We'd like to work toward it, um, at least not, not in person. Um, certainly uh, clubs could uh, meet or, or conduct activities uh, virtually. Um, someone asked stable cohorts, why are we focusing on um, 12 uh, or 15? Uh, there's two aspects of the county framework that um, are limiting to us. The first is social distancing. Um, our classrooms are 960 square feet for the most part without accounting for the cabinetry, uh, the sinks, or the furniture. And so um, if you had none of those things and no teacher, in theory, you could get 25 and a half uh, students into uh, a classroom and each give them six square feet of space. But with cabinetry and with sinks and with furniture and with a teacher, um, we expect that um, we can't even get uh, 25. So um, that's gonna cut us down to probably a max of 15, 16 or so. Um, our biggest classrooms typically have 30 students in them. So that's how we're, we're um, ending up around 12 or 13 or 15 because 
um, we would uh, typically cut our, our 25 uh, student classrooms in half and our 30 student classrooms in half. We do have some SDC classrooms and those are smaller, um, eight, 10, 12 students. Those might be able to meet, um, if not every day, uh, certainly close to every day. Um, and we do wanna focus on um, equity on, on students who have special needs and make sure we're meeting those. And so we um, will be looking at strategic groupings uh, for our students with IEPs. Those are individualized education plans and also who need uh, special education support services. Um, someone asked if Wednesdays are still planned to be half days. Uh, currently, yes. Uh, someone asked about SAMTRANS. Um, busing for students at Ralston uh, would be very different because buses might only be able to take um, an eighth, a tenth of their normal capacity. Uh, maybe not a tenth. Uh, you might be able to, to put 15, maybe 20 students in, into a bus, but uh, social distancing, as I understand it, will be expected on the buses. So um, bus services will be uh, challenged. Someone asked about budget cuts. Um, I did write about budget cuts in previous um, Friday or Saturday updates. So if you go to the, the district website and read about um, my updates on budget cuts, I do speak about um, the areas that we were making reductions in. People asked about face shields versus masks. I don't have a, a, a ready answer for that. Ching Pei, do you have a ready answer if shields are a, a adequate substitute? I don't know from the county health guidelines. Um, yeah, we can look into that. Um, that'll be a popular question heading heading towards um, August. Nancy had mentioned on the training yesterday that the shields don't offer the same protection as the right. masks, but right. there would be some instances when that would be appropriate. Right. So for students with sensory issues, for example, you might um, need to go with a shield, but I, it's my understanding that um, face coverings are preferred. Um, and so that will be uh, the initial expectation. Um, someone asked about masks in PE. Um, right now, uh, we don't expect to offer in-person PE at the elementary level and um, our models for Ralston, because normally our classes are much bigger in PE, uh, 40, 45 uh, students. It's very difficult for us with the, with the groupings um, to do PE in person because we're trying to have those students in those groups of 15 and we don't have enough PE teachers to see groups of 15 uh, for PE class. So we're current, our current thinking is to have Ralston PE um, done via distance learning and then all other six classes to be done in person. Um, another question was about what happens when the teacher is out. Uh, if the teacher's out, we were looking at possibly um, having a substitute, but that substitute might have to engage in distance learning. You can imagine um, if you were a substitute, going to a different classroom every day might not be a good idea, especially if there was a possible case and we're trying to do contact tracing. We don't want um, people uh, going and, and visiting all the different classrooms or all the different cohorts. So that's why um, we're looking at elementary science being done remotely. Um, elementary music being done remotely, um, the types of, of um, um, itinerant uh, services that are done in, in multiple different classrooms by one teacher, those would certainly be um, having to, to change. Um, that, those were the topics that I scanned um, initially. Uh, we also want to hear from you uh, and not just uh, force you to listen to our talking the whole time. So maybe, um, Pam, if you have participants who are raising their hand and are keeping track of the order. Why don't we shift to that and um, get some one minute uh, comments and questions uh, directly from the audience. Okay, uh, the first question is from William Lai. So uh, Mr. Lai, uh, we'll give you permission to, um, you know, we'll, uh, as a participant, you'll be able to speak and we invite you to uh, share your thinking or question. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Okay. I had to unmute myself. So um, I just have a, have a, it's a quick question. Uh, I may have missed it through the conversation or even yep. through 
whatnot. Um, on those days uh, where kids are not going to be going in. So if they're, if, if group A is at school and group B is, is not assigned to go in, uh, what is the plan for the, those that are, that are not in school? Uh, will, they, will the teacher be doing some sort of live cast or, or web, you know, as part of the, the group that's in, um, or is it gonna be full distance learning? Um, we'll work, potentially work towards um, students at home being able to watch the lesson at school. But right now we're concerned about our teacher's ability to do that, as well as our student's ability to do that. Um, asking a first grader to remotely watch uh, six hours of school and, and learn everything um, is, a, is a tall order. And asking our teachers to both take advantage of the in-person instruction and deal with or, or attend to the learning of the other half of the class um, who may or may not be paying attention remotely, uh, maybe asking a little too much. I think we could work towards that, towards the latter portion of the year, but at least at the beginning, in-person is just for the folks uh, who are in the class right there. And then Ching Pei, do you wanna talk a little bit about some of the um, homework, independent study, um, and specialists uh, services that, that or lessons that we envision for the off day? Yeah, so for the off day for um, most of the students, I think the, the sixth through eighth, we, we have some flexibility and, and, and more staff. But for the K-5, we're thinking for the independent study day, let's just for for sake of the conversation, say we're on a, my A group is on campus every Monday and Thursday. So I come to school on Monday, I'm going to get my reading and writing and math and, and all of my core content area. And my teacher at the end of the day will say, and you know, make sure you do this writing prompt tomorrow. And here's an extra math worksheet. And here's a game you can play. And maybe here's a YouTube video for science that you can watch for tomorrow. And that's what kids would do on their time at home. Plus, if we have specials that are provided either by PTA or by the school at the grade level, during those off days, we would recommend that the, the contracted specialists and definitely our employee specialists would deliver live instruction at home, well, from, from school to your home for science and, and, and music so that the kids would not be left to their own devices per se on their off day, but there wouldn't be the general ed classroom teacher monitoring and supporting and providing daily feedback because that teacher still has their B group with them for the full school day. So Jingpei, that's music in third, fourth, and fifth grade, um, science in fourth and fifth, and fewer For anybody who has an IEP, our reading specialists who work in um, K-5. Um, so if your child sees Mrs. Wilkinson right. or they'll, they'll, they'll be remote too, just so we don't have cross-pollination and you know, OT learning center resource teachers. At Ralston, Lara and I have been really looking at the schedules and what we think we can do for the students who are in RSP at Ralston, rather than saying their services are going to be delivered remotely, we believe we can do a co-teaching model and rather than having two teachers paired with 60 students or three teachers paired with 90 students, we're, we're trying to work out the proper numbers right now. We basically can assign an RSP teacher by grade level to that group of 90 or that group of 60. And now we have an extra staff member who can support and co-teach and be part of that pod and be part of the stable cohort. So kids would be able to be in class with their general ed peers and not always separated off um, with students who also have resource need. Thank you. Uh, Pam, next question or comment? Uh, Tyrone Jones. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. First of all, I mean, I want to thank you guys for creating the platform and the forum. Um, I sit on, uh, I've sat on, on, on conference calls, both nationally and internationally, and I feel like we've been very, I can't speak for the entire uh, parent population, but we've been very fortunate to have a, a great distance learning experience. Um, as an educator, I understand the complexity of it. And um, I think we were on the fortunate end. Obviously we have the resources, but I understand that we're, I'm acutely aware that this is isolated to, in some instances, Redwood, you know, our, our district and in particular Nesbitt. Nesbitt did a phenomenal job and the teachers that my children had did a phenomenal job. That being said, um, I know that, well, I have one that's going to Rawson in the fall. There's a consideration for longer, uh, longer periods and 
as an adult, I don't like to sit for longer periods myself <laughs> in my own profession. I'm right there with you. Yes. Any of my previous supervisors could tell you I can only sit for a limited period of time. I'm no less engaged, but I might have to stand up and walk around the room. Yep. Will there be as much as is tolerable and, and respective of social and physical distancing, will there be an encouragement for teachers to um, allow for movement, be it standing, sitting on a ball chair? Are there some sort of accommodations that can be made to physically in, you know, engage or allow for physical movement so that they can be mentally engaged as needed, if that makes sense? It's a great suggestion. I have the same problem. Um, yes, we have, uh, over the last, I wanna say five years, we've seen a lot more of the kids sitting on yoga balls and having some alternative seating arrangements. We would encourage for longer periods when the teacher sees that the kids are getting antsy to let them stand up, get the wiggles out, or even take a lap around the field. Um, right now, we were looking at one point at two and a half hour classes. Um, right now, we're looking at three classes at a time at Ralston with 90 minute classes. So that's not quite as challenging as the two and a half hour class, but Currently, we're looking at a student taking three classes in the first quarter, three classes in the second quarter, with that PE class being done um, remotely. Unfortunately, PE is not the best class to take remotely, but, but given our staffing ratios and whatnot, we think we're looking at that right now. But that's a very good question. Um, I know a lot of people, not just in terms of uh, kids being able to focus, but their overall mental health, we're going to try to do our best to attend to that. Thank you. Um, Pam, next. Uh, next would be Saurav Sen. Hello. Uh, Hello. Thank you so much for hosting and letting us uh, like participate. Uh, I have two questions. Should I ask both of them together? And then you can answer like in which order you want. My first question is uh, uh, like being in the tech industry, we know that Zoom is not the best uh, tool for remote conferencing because of all its security concerns. So are we uh, planning to use any alternate medium like Google Meets, which are much more secure? And the second question is, what happens in case there's an exposure to COVID-19, any of the E or B groups in any of the schools? Like what is our mitigation strategy there? Thank you. Um, so uh, Chingpei, you wanna talk about Google Meet versus Zoom and, and um, our thinking there? Yeah, I, I was just responding to the to a similar question. I don't think from the same person. We are purchasing enterprise licenses for both Google Meets and Zoom coming in the fall. Um, the the kind of free upgrade that we were offered is obviously going away June thirtieth, and we wanted to make sure we had dual platforms for our staff to choose from. Both Meets and Zoom are COPA compliant. That's the Student Privacy Act for public schools. They're FERPA compliant and they are HIPAA compliant. So either one of the two platforms will, will protect our students, um, will protect our staff. And then the security features that have been implemented make it quite easy for teachers to control who's in and who's out um, from waiting rooms to uh, authenticated users and whatnot. So we feel confident that having two platforms in the fall will make it such that we have backup and some choice, some professional choice. Um, our experience this spring was Zoom uh, kept getting better at security and invested a lot into it. Uh, we expect Google to do the same. So we have arrangements with both and um, we plan to use the, the you know, we will have access to both next year, but we want to offer um, uh, a good mix for teachers of functionality and security. Um, uh, the second question was about what if there's a case, uh, what if there's contact with cases of, of you know, a family members uh, 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 contracts uh, COVID, what then? Um, the county office is gonna have, um, the health department is going to have strict uh, protocols. So if we have uh, contacts, you know, my expectation is that we would uh, revert to distance learning for those uh, affected cohorts and um, assess the situation and then resume as um, the guidance uh, uh, provided. So really, we're not going to be health experts. We're going to rely on the county health office. Um, and they've been terrific so far in terms of providing that guidance. Um, someone uh, pointed out uh, 
the inconsistencies of this spring's uh, distance learning. And that is uh, very much on the board's mind and the staff's mind as we uh, look ahead to the fall and working on uh, uh, doing better. Um, I wanna make sure that we don't um, uh, in any way blame our teachers for our inconsistency. Uh, we take responsibility for that, but we will, uh, we're definitely motivated to learn from experience and provide a, a more consistent distance learning um, model um, in the fall. But based upon the survey data we're seeing, um, we don't see the, the large majority of families preferring distance learning. So we feel like we will provide the most consistent program in person and that's what we're best at. And that's also what's best for students. So we are biased towards that, but we do want to learn from experience because you know, the, the county has advised us that we should be ready to go back into distance learning at any time. And so um, that's our orientation. Um, Pam, next. Um, there's been some questions in the Q&A about distance learning and whether it's going to be um, an option for parents to just choose distance learning. And if they do choose that, um, who would be the teacher and how would the teacher work? Um, and then one other question on siblings, will siblings be kept in the same cohort schedules? So the, the, I'll take the easy one first, uh, was the, the um, siblings. Yes, you know, we had joked about um, uh, grouping by last name, so wanted to do that. And as we mentioned earlier on, um, we do want to offer a distance learning um, option. Now, whether that um, distance learning teacher would be school site based or more district uh, based, we don't, um, we haven't determined yet, but uh, we plan to offer distance learning for families that want it. However, we won't be able to offer um, the choice that people can, can choose and go back and forth. Um, once you choose distance learning, we're going to expect that you stick with it for a, a sustained period of time. Um, and for those folks who choose uh, in person, we would uh, expect them to stay with the in person program because, again, we're going to be designing um, our program uh, based on those interests. Uh, Pam, next que question or comment? Okay, the next uh, comment would be from Paul. It's no last name. Hi, Paul. Paul, you're up. <laughs> okay, should we move on to the next yeah, person? No problem. Parmeet uh, Manman. Hello, Parmeet. There we are. Hello? Hi, Parmi. We can hear you. Let's take your questions. Um, my question is more about inside of the classroom, just the HVAC controls. I, I wanted to know if the district is modifying any controls in the classroom to maximize outside air so that the kids are getting fresh air and the air is being circulated per the regulations. Yes. So um, they, the, um, the health framework uh, does speak to that, uh, changing um, the filters at the beginning of the term, um, opening windows and doors for cross ventilation, encouraging teachers to teach outdoors uh, when the weather's uh, amenable to it. So absolutely, we're gonna do our best to um, uh, provide uh, circulation. There's a county group, uh, a self-insurance group that really uh, supports us with facilities planning uh, called SMCSIG, the San Mateo County Schools Insurance Group. And so, yes, we, we do plan to maximize ventilation and um, try to make sure that uh, um, we follow the county's guidance um, in that way. Uh, next, Pam. Um, Maria Centeno. Hello, Maria. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, I was wondering uh, about uh, giving certain preference to to groups like kindergarten. Kindergarten are, are the group that are more difficult to supplement with uh, online alternative resources. You know, is the 
it's a time of phonetics, you know, of reading, and there's the most difficult group to work independently with online tools. So is there any thought to give priority to kindergarten for, for on-site? Yes, um, we thought of that early on and with our same staffing ratios, um, we would need to have um, uh, much bigger classes at the higher levels in order to um, have more staff at the lower levels. So it could be something that we uh, pursued, but we would need to negotiate some different staffing arrangements with our employee groups. And so that's something we can explore, but we certainly cannot promise. Pam? Uh, Kyle Stansel. Kylie, sorry, Stansel. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, uh, my question is how far in advance to the start of the school year will we actually know which group or cohort, cohort we're in? Um, I know you said you're separating maybe alphabetically, but we have relatives that we also have um, after school care with. So if one family is a letter F, and the other family is a letter S. You know, how far in advance will we know that we need to try to change groups and what would the process be in trying to do that um, as far as that or teachers? Because usually with teachers, we don't know until what, two days before the school starts? Yeah, we're gonna try to do better than two days before the school starts. Uh, but Ching Pei, you work more closely with the principals than I do. What's your best guess on when we might be able to let people know? Um, I, I mean, I want to set realistic expectations. Are we looking at the end of July? I think depending on how quickly they come to a model, um, the principals typically aren't around in July. I would say realistically the first week of August is something we could ask of them. I, I do want to try and get them on their class list sooner rather than later, because I know this has big ramifications for the families. I think um, a couple of questions have come up. We will try to keep siblings together. Of course, that would be our number one concern. However, some of you might say, you know what? I'd rather have one kid at home at a time and you wanna request that they be on opposite schedules. We'll do our best. Some of you might want to uh, have these siblings and, and cousins and others that you share childcare with and you might wanna request that they be on the same schedule so that you can stay on the same pod and stay, you know, share the childcare. Those are all things that I think are gonna have to, that will happen at a local level where the principals will take your requests and do their best. Um, I don't wanna make promises that I can't keep because we we still have to look at all, you know, unfortunately kids don't come in magic bubbles of 12 and 15. So we will do our best, um, but I think it's gonna be a site decision and probably early August is the earliest we can get anything to families. Yeah. Uh, Rico Medina. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, sorry, I think we missed some of the overview. Can I just get a quick understanding? If the you have two different sets of kids coming in every day to the same teacher, then the teacher is exposed to both sets? Correct. Correct. The teacher okay. is exposed to both sets either on the same day or day one and day two. So the teacher is exposed to their full 25 or 30. Um, they're the connective tissue between. So it's essentially your full class is still considered a class. However, we don't have the physical space for all 25 to be in the classroom at the same time and six feet apart. Right, okay, thank you. I just wanted to understand. No problem. Pam. Okay, um, Amit Harani. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Awesome. Is the plan, um, are you guys laying out the plan for entire year or is this like a quarterly plan, half yearly and you'll be flexible based on the whole COVID situation? Um, good question, uh, Suwerna. Um, you've been in a lot of the um, county level uh, discussions for elected uh, leaders. Uh, Suwerna is our board president. What, what's your thinking? I think there's going to be flexibility from my understanding is the framework lays out sort of uh, four phases and the the when we started in March 13th and there was the everybody shelter in place that was sort of phase one 
we're someplace right now in between phase, we're certainly in phase two, perhaps phase three, depending um, on how scheduling is done. Um, and so by that, the phase two, my understanding is you'd have somewhere in phase two versus phase three, 25 to 50% of students back. Um, and then phase four would be that, you know, we would try to go back to as close as normal as possible. So my understanding at this point is we're in the phase where we're trying to bring back 25 to 50% of our students on campus um, at one time. And we're um, being optimistic that by August, you know, we will be able to at least have 50% of our students and that, hence, that's why we're talking about an AB schedule. Jim? So um, I would just add to that, that the flexibility is going to have to go both ways, right? So if we find out that we roll into a particular phase and then our uh, COVID numbers go up to the point where they're affecting hospitals and their ability to take care of patients safely, then you might see some flexibility downwards uh, that we have to move back towards more uh, strict restrictions. Um, and then, you know, if we're very fortunate that we have safe and effective treatments or safe and effective uh, vaccines that become available, then the flexibility is going to move the other direction. So it really kind of depends on um, how the population statistics evolve uh, in either direction. Um, thank you. Uh, Pam? Uh, uh, Alana Philippi. Hi. Um, so my question is regarding the special education services. The services via Zoom were not effective for my child this year. And I don't, I'm already concerned about how far behind she is. And I'm concerned about continuing to do them via Zoom for the next school year is going to be ineffective. So is there going to be an option to have in-person special education services? Um, we will uh, do our best. Uh, the challenge is um, typically a learning center at, I don't know which uh, grade level your student is at. Ching Pei talked about in grades six, seven, and eight at Ralston, trying to allow for the teacher to be one of the teachers in the classroom in person. Um, for our K-5 program, we typically have um, students uh, being supported by the learning center teacher in grades K all the way through five. And so even if we concentrated the student placement such that the um, teacher only needed to support one classroom um, per grade level, we would still be having them potentially go to um, six different grade levels. So. It's possible that pullout services, um, we may be able to set something up, but right now um, the current plan is, is remote um, services and we realize that doesn't work for everyone. So we're gonna keep after the in-person option and we appreciate the advocacy. Kim? Uh, the next person is Winslow, no last name. Looks like maybe he lowered his hand. Let's move to the next person, Sierra Gonzalez. Nope, okay. Uh, <laughs> Suhas Joshi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi. Uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, my question is, are you, do you have any plans to systematically measure the impact all of this is having on the learning um, uh, of the students and feed that information back to the county? And what I'm hearing right now is county is deciding this and it seems very one dimensional to me. Uh, there is always a trade off. I mean, obviously this is a massive inconvenience to a lot of people. And it is basically, yeah, we, we are rolling with it right now. And especially the spring because everyone was taken by surprise, but now we're talking about fall and maybe next year. So there is a cost to be paid by all involved. I mean, the students, teachers, administrators, everybody. 
And are we, like, do we have a way to measure the learning impact and feed it back to the county to, to make sure that they are not just saying, yeah, now shut every, everything down uh, because that's the most medical thing to do. So I just want your comment on that. Thank you. Um, Ching Pei, I'm sure you can speak to um, the fact that we will continue to assess student progress and, and be able to, to monitor that. Someone asked about state tests online, and I said we weren't sure if there would be statewide testing next spring. Uh, that's to be determined. But um, Ching Pei, just uh, a couple of sentences on our assessments um, for monitoring student progress. We will absolutely reassess all of our students when they come back to school with our kind of general reading, writing, math test to get a sense of where we are, how far behind our students are as, as a collective whole. And my teacher leaders and I are working on both a scope and sequence to help support our teachers moving into next year, knowing that they'll probably only have half of the year. They're not gonna cover the full curriculum, but they, that doesn't mean they're not gonna cover the full learning. Um, the other piece that we're working on talking about right now is how do we accelerate learning in the time that we have with the kids? How do we make sure that the learning and the teaching that's happening in the classroom is really efficient and effective? Um, I think it's an opportunity for us to look at our practices, but ultimately we'll assess our kids, see where they are, and then make a plan to make sure we, we keep them progressing and that we continue monitoring their growth and supporting them throughout the school year. Michael, could you um, speak to the the county um, health uh, directives uh, in terms of what that means in terms of force of law. There was some insinuation that we might have some pushback on them in terms of the effect on learning versus health, but um, there are some limitations we have there, right? Yes, um, this framework is not a county health order, but the expectation is that a county health order from the county health officer will accompany this and, and effectively give it the weight of law. So this isn't an optional um, framework to follow or it's not guidance or advice that we can take or leave. Um, however, the, the county superintendent, uh, we have a good relationship with and we're communicating with her regularly and she has a, um, a channel of communication with the, the health officer. So if the health officer is being unreasonable um, in our opinion, we, can't, we have a means of of sharing that feedback with him. Um, and uh, so far their relation bit, relationship, that of the county superintendent and the, um, the county health officer has been very collaborative. So um, we're, we trust that that will continue. Uh, Pam? Uh, Brandy Johansson. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, this is Olaf Johansson, actually. Um, um, first of all, thank you so much to the school uh, district and the teachers. I think all parents have realized just how much work teachers do uh, this spring by having our kids at home and, and having to um, help them get educated as parents. One thing that uh, I'm wondering is since one of the big problems with getting the classes together in the fall is about space um, in the classrooms that are there today. How much has been explored around finding more space somewhere else. Hotels are probably empty. Um, they have ballrooms. Uh, we do have outdoor areas, things like that. How much of that has been explored? Thank you. Um, I see us being able to potentially do, um, uh, take advantage of, you know, we could potentially do tents on our fields and our blacktops. Um, and if you doubled the square footage, you could have a full class. Um, uh, from having done the rough math, um, I think it was, it was be pretty, uh, uh, challenging, uh, for us, but it's something that we can explore. Um, in my experience, the, you know, you could use, uh, the convention center or, or hotels that would, in, in my experience, the, the hotels haven't, uh, shared their space for free and given our resource constraints. Um, we, you know, we would be really hampered to rent out space, but certainly we can uh, continue to explore the tent option. I think that's a, that's a good suggestion. Um, uh, Pam? Mark Star Stavely. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Um, so I have a follow-up question about grouping friends together. Uh, so my daughter is going into third grade uh, and she and her BFFs are hoping to be in the same cohort. However, their names are on opposite sides of the alphabet. So I'm wondering how to make the request that they get placed together and how that decision gets made. We're gonna rely on our principals. Uh, Ching Pei, is that correct? And, and obviously we wanna support them with some survey, uh, technical survey support from the district office to make sure those kinds of questions because yeah. the alphabet for the last name can be the first rough cut. But you, you know, again, we've, we've other factors for consideration have been raised, whether it's after school childcare plans or if it is um, friendships. Um, and also we talked about um, special education support. So there's a lot of uh, potential variables that might impact um, uh, pairings or groupings. And so we're just gonna have to think through those in the next couple of weeks and then execute, execute um, over uh, July and the first week of August. Yeah, we'll certainly work with principals to make sure that there is a good survey so that you can indicate your preferences and your priorities. Uh, and I'll work with them and support them to make the best assignments to accommodate as many families requests as possible. Pam. Uh, Jasmine Gao. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, everyone, Dr. Malikan, that um, all the staff putting together this presentation. So my question is, when will you know um, which options you will adapt? Um, and also what the group mix, when will you know? Uh, thank you. We were talking about the groups being uh, potentially assigned and identified in um, early August. And um, um, Suwerna, uh, what are your expectations in terms of um, when we might have an outline, which of these models? Um, uh, I know ideally it might be at the next board meeting, but um, if we need more time, it may go into late June. Right, we have our next board meeting is uh, June 18th, where we'll get um, a presentation about the latest survey updated data. And we'll also talk about the different models and, and we'll hear from um, the advisory committee, the breakout sessions that we've been having and the board will hear that and give some guidance. Um, we would ideally have a model that we choose by June 18th, um, but I think it's going to depend on um, a number of factors and, and some of which is gonna be um, discussed in the next two um, advisory committee breakout meetings. So I think that our goal would be by the end of, of June, but uh, we recognize that this is an ongoing issue, things are changing um, the, the COVID situation may change as well. And so um, the board is also considering um, perhaps having um, a, a meeting in July. And we, our interest is in, in trying to um, make a decision as soon as possible, but we wanna make the right decision with um, the proper stakeholder input. So we don't wanna rush into a decision just to say we've made it. We wanna make uh, the right decision for the community and our staff. Thank you, Pam. Michael Healy. Yeah, hello, you can hear me? Yes. Cool, thanks. Uh, I just wanna say i uh, really impressed with your work, uh, everybody, but particularly Dr. Milliken, I found your communication exceedingly helpful. Uh, could you comment on the transition to the new superintendent so I feel like this is not a great time to be making a change. Uh, just that's my thought. I don't know, but uh, it definitely makes me nervous. I know the incoming superintendent has an existing job. They have to go do things, but this seems like a really not a great time to be making a change on that. So if you could just comment on that, that would be great. Sure. Uh, Dan DeGuara is uh, an experienced educator. He and I have been talking weekly for um, a couple of months now. 
He's been joining our standing uh, district uh, administrative team um, meetings uh, that we have. Uh, he's joined our principal meetings. He's uh, been watching our board meetings. Um, so he's been very involved. He's not here tonight because his district is having their last board meeting of the year. Um, and so he's having to present their models to their school board um, right now. So um, um, I've been very impressed with him. Uh, Suwerna, you can speak to um, you know, his strengths uh, and his, you, know, you and he, I know, have talked about his transition. Um, perhaps you wanna say a few words. I, I can understand because I'm a parent in the district as well, the anxiety about transitions. Um, we agree, Dr. Milliken and the outgoing team have done an excellent job of preparing us in this really challenging time. Um, but I just wanna assure everybody and the board um, spent quite a bit of time early on in uh, the school year. Actually, we were, we were quite early in our process, which is why we were able to um, attract a great uh, group of candidates for the new superintendent. And we're very confident in Dan DeGara's abilities to take over right where uh, the leadership team will be um, leaving off. And so um, just as Dr. Milliken mentioned in terms of the transition process, that's already starting to happen um, and is ongoing. And the board is um, committed to making sure that the new leadership team is going to start off um, with the, you know, on the ground running and not trying to catch up. And so we feel very confident um, in Mr. Degara's abilities, as well as the new uh, CBO and the new uh, director of HR. And I might, would invite any of my other colleagues just to say a few words because we were all in the, the um, process together. Yeah, I wanted to also add that um, in addition to the new team already working with the existing team, um, the existing team is also saying, hey, we'll be available to answer questions and if things pop up, because um, as with any transitions, it, it does take a while um, and things pop up that may not have been covered during the planned transition time. Um, but fortunately, you know, the, the existing team has already said, hey, if things come up, we're still available by phone. Uh, so we'll make sure that the transition is smooth. Michael, there's been a couple questions about what would happen if uh, schools had to suddenly shut down again or if there was a spike in cases that caused a shelter in place again. So the short answer is we go back to what we what we just did in the spring, but try to do it better. Um, you know, we know that we had inconsistency from classroom to classroom uh, this spring. Um, we know that, uh, you know, we we had some inconsistencies in, in program and, and teacher support. So we wanna take advantage of the summer, provide that training, provide that support. We heard at Ralston, for example, that different teachers were using different platforms and that was causing people headaches. So we recognize that better communication, uh, more direct uh, teacher-student contact, uh, more consistency, um, more of a, uh, a schedule to follow, um, and also, you know, that single source of truth that um, students could go to at the upper grades to find their assignments and, and, and whatnot. Um, also making sure that we had, whether it be Zoom or, or phone access to teachers uh, and students could check in with not only their teacher, but with one another. So we, we um, have heard a lot of feedback this spring. We recognize that what we set up wasn't as consistent and um, didn't meet the students needs quite as consistently as we would expect. And so the plan is to, to learn from that experience. Um, Pam, did I, uh, oh, and people asked about getting, um, oh yeah. And so the expectation is that the county health officer is gonna tell us whether it's a cohort that needs to um, go back to distance learning, whether it's an entire school or whether it's the entire district or county. And so we all have to be ready for that. Pam? Paul? Hey, Paul. Can you hear me, can you hear me yes. this time? Ah, yep. wonderful. 
All right. Uh, first, I want to start with a compliment. Um, Tannis Teamer at Central Elementary was just unbelievably great this year. I cannot say enough good things. My, you know, it was not easy getting my son through second grade, but she was just a, just a hero. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm super, super pro how fast the school district tried to adapt. It's a very difficult situation. And so my, my question is coming from trying to figure out what the future looks like and what what does success look like like what are what are we trying to do in balancing sort of the health concerns and the academic concerns and i think there's also some community concerns and maybe like wrapping around that as a parent and we've got a lot of parents on the line a lot of us donate to school force donate to the pta what can we do to help so what's success and what can we do to help Um, do any board members want to talk about what they see as a, a successful program in the fall? Uh, I want to just make sure Ching Pei and I aren't dominating. Um, okay. Uh, for me, um, you know, we, we want to educate kids and get them ready for that next school experience, whether it be preparing them for high school, college career. Um, but there's more to school than learning the academics. Um, there, we want to educate the whole child. We want to prepare them socially and emotionally and, and make sure that they're growing with their people skills, their self-regulation, their executive functioning, um, their ability to uh, do the right thing and stand up for uh, a friend who might be uh, getting picked on or, or not feeling well or, or showing signs of depression. Um, there's also you know, the, the function of school districts that we don't really talk about that often, but is, is on the minds of a lot of parents, which is the childcare function um, and having a safe place for your child to go to school during the day. Um, and so we're mindful of all of those roles, uh, the academic role, the social emotional support and, and the provision of childcare. Now we realize that not everyone expects or needs the childcare from us. And that's why we are offering the, um, the distance learning component. But, but for us, it's doing our best across those uh, two or three dimensions to serve the kids well. Um, and so success is going to show itself in our healthy kids survey, which, which does measure that social emotional component. Um, we give that, uh, that healthy kids survey every year. Um, it's, gonna, it's gonna show itself in academic data, reading, writing, mathematics, et cetera. Um, and uh, the parents will let us know how we're doing on the childcare front, I'm quite confident. Um, then to how you can help, I mean, you know, normally uh, parent volunteers are a huge help, but we don't get to have parent volunteers in the fall. Um, you know, as, as of now, we're facing some budget cuts and what if people do have um, any discretionary money that they want to put towards their child's education, a, a donation of school for us by June 30, is a huge help. It's a big shot in the arm and helps us preserve quality. And, and you know, we may not go buy a teacher with the uh, $1,000 uh, or $500 or $100 that you donate, but we might invest it in, in we'll likely invest it in teacher learning and that will, that will um, trans, translate into a better program for your child. So we work very closely with school force and make sure that the money that's donated to school force gets put to every student in the district and, and goes to program quality. And so either we are hiring specialist teachers. When we do that, we are able to pay the folks funded from our district fund a little bit more. And, it, 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 and we can also invest in professional development and, and overall program quality. So just know that donations to school force um, benefit everyone and um, they really affect um, the quality of the person we put in front of your child. And so, um, you know, just be reassured that that money doesn't disappear in the district um, budget, that it, it gets put to use in your child's classroom. Uh, Pam, next question. Oh, actually, can I add one oh, more yeah, yeah, thing please, from a, a board perspective? Um, I, I think it's also, for me, success is also making sure that we have an equity lens on everything that we're doing. And that's actually something that the County Office of Ed is reminding everyone to, is to approach the models and how we reopen schools with that equity lens in mind. Like the, the data showed that 
we are fortunate that 70% of our families have enough devices for all of their children to do the remote learning. So we're very different from a lot of other districts that have much higher needs, but there are still uh, students that won't be able to access the learning in the same way or have the same success. And so to me, success also means understanding what the different student needs are, remaining student focused and student centered and making sure that we're, we're meeting the needs of different types of children and different family situations. I would add, um, uh, thanks Amy. And I would add um, some qualitative things that I think we all would appreciate, you know, that it looks like our children are excited to learn, that they're engaged and that they're challenged, uh, no matter what the um, environment ends up being, whether it's in-person learning or um, distance learning. And so we wanna provide consistency from uh, uh, grade to grade and site to site, um, and make sure that the kids are really happy to get involved and get back to learning. Um, you know, just that enthusiasm piece uh, goes a long way with them making their own self-growth. Um, and just a, a quick note, we had planned for this, for this meeting to go about 90 minutes. We're about 90 minutes in. Um, there are 238 open questions uh, right now in the Q&A. So we're not going to be able to get to everyone's question, um, but you know we can develop an FAQ uh, page um, and populate it over the next uh, few days, and make sure we share the link to that um, in my next update and and work to get you the information that you feel like you need to make the decision about childcare, to make the decision about in-person versus uh, distance learning, and to make sure that we hear your concerns, your questions, your, your advice on what we ought to pay attention to. So one of the things I hadn't been thinking about so much is putting students with their friends. And over the last few days, we've gotten a lot of feedback and a lot of questions on that. So now that's very much in our radar. So please know that your input does make a difference. Uh, Pam, next, next question or comment? Uh, that would be Coach Daniel. Coach. Thank you. you. Hear me? Yeah, we can. Hi, yeah. Uh, hi, I was just uh, checking in. I'm actually uh, wrapping up our second week of camp with all the new safety protocols. And I'm very confident that we can get this done. I was just uh, wondering if it's possible considering the limitations of space, would there be extensions to the days of school that kids would be available to come in if that's even a possibility or given uh, non sites like Barrett providing child care for the non social distancing days. Right. If so just before sense. you before you go off, let me ask a clarifying question. So when you say extending the, the days, are you talking about a longer day or a longer school year? I'm, I'm thinking like a Saturday option, possibly, yeah. gotcha. if that's even if that's even on the radar. Um, I've just been able to kind of experience what it's like to be back in the setting of a classroom. This is our second week over uh, doing camps over at Shores. Yeah. And I can see with all the measures we've taken into place, uh, things have been going great. Um, I actually have my daughter attending as well. And I can say that we've been trained. Uh, Footsteps has provided us with additional uh, training to make it easier for us to understand how to be more cautious and safe. Um, so I'm wondering if that will affect uh, being able to provide the child care for families that need it on the non-social distancing days. Yeah, so um, it'll be tough for us to um, impose a longer work day or longer work year on our teachers without offering something to compensate them in return. So for now, we're looking at a, a normal school day, a normal school year, uh, which is 180 uh, days of school. Um, and then on those off days, yes, I do know that Footsteps is planning to offer some offsite care at um, Barrett. I do know that I would expect that there might be some other providers. Um, one of the things that does make me a little bit concerned is if we're very careful about keeping people, uh, students and teachers in stable cohorts um, on those A days, and then they go mix on the B days, um, our efforts are somewhat for naught. So, um, we'll have to work closely with Footsteps and other child care providers to try to make sure that um, 
you know, if nothing else, we're trying to at least group students by grade level and school and trying to make sure that we're not having um, excessive mixing. So uh, thanks, uh, uh, Daniel. We appreciate the, uh, the perspective. Thank and you. Best wishes for the summer, summer programs. Thank you. Pam? Yes, uh, Philippe Clavel. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yeah, I'll ask a question for him. I was wondering at Ralston, there are several periods for each ch child. Are you planning on keeping a cohort in the same classroom and then teachers coming in in turn for each period? Yes. Is that the current plan? Yes. So your student would be with another 14 students and they would stay together and they would have um, three different teachers come visit them over the course of the day and teach them three different subjects. And so that would limit the, um, the mixing um, and uh, they would take three classes every other day for the first quarter. So that's the first 45 days of the school year, 45 school days. And then second quarter, they would take another different three classes and that would happen for the, the second quarter. And yes, they would be with a group of 15 um, and the three different teachers would come to them. We don't, we don't think we would have the students have a passing period where they're mixing, but the teachers would potentially move uh, rather than the students. Um, we'd have to talk through the logistics of that with the teachers because typically they keep their instructional materials with them in their classrooms. So we just wanna make sure that we're um, talking it through and that we don't present this as a done deal. We, need to, we still need to work it through with our staff. Uh, MJ Edwards. Hello. Hello, MJ. Hi, uh, thank you all and thank you for the time. Um, my uh, rising fifth grader is actually sitting here in the room with me. He's been very interested in this conversation. And he and I both have the same question about what are you hearing from the teaching staff in terms of them coming back and having stable a stable faculty for next year of the same teachers? Good question. We're he hearing a lot of different things. We had a staff meeting this afternoon um, and Qingpei, did, was it about 150 participants? I've... About 165. Yeah, so we've been hearing from staff. Um, they are very um, concerned about making sure we keep classrooms, bathrooms clean. Uh, that was uh, a topic of um, interest. Uh, there was obvious interest in um, support for distance learning, whether that be technical training planning time, giving them time to collaborate and share best practices. Uh, Ching Pei, um, can you speak to some of the other things we're hearing from teachers and staff? Teachers are concerned with the amount of prep time it will take. Um, they are certainly concerned with making sure that they are able to do their best job for their, their students. Um, I, I feel like the morning and afternoon schedule is, is Kind of polarizing. Some people love it. Some people hate it. The ones who, who hate it are of um, are worried that after a couple of hours with the students and then prepping their room and getting it ready for the next group, will they have the energy to do a good job for the second half of the group? Um, that's just something that's coming up. They are also concerned with having too much distance between seeing the students. So the one week on one week off, even though it's perfect for cleaning and, and airing out the classroom and just kind of the natural break of the weekend makes it um, feel a little safer. The teachers are really worried that after ultimately nine days away from the classroom, when you count the two weekends, they'll be reteaching a lot every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and losing a lot of ground more so than if kids were coming every other day. Um, right. And so just a, a variety, um, you know, teachers also um, don't want to get sick. They don't want to um, inadvertently get other students uh, sick. And so, you know, they have the same interests around um, their health, student health. 
um, making sure that we don't have too much traffic in the front office. We just we heard a lot of um, a variety of perspectives that were very helpful in our staff meeting this afternoon. Um, so we're not, we had uh, planned on ending around 8.30. Um, shall we um, maybe uh, continue with the Q&A and then do like a hard stop at nine o'clock or what, what are your thoughts? I, I think that I was gonna suggest that as well because I'm counting at least a dozen more folks who have their hands up for questions. And um, so I, I think um, without objection, we ought to continue till nine. Super. So we'll continue to nine and, and um, we'll uh, try to do more listening than talking. Uh, Pam. Um, Meng Meng Liu. Looks like maybe she dropped off. Okay, how about Chris Walton? Hi there, uh, thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Milliken for your time. A um, uh, couple quick questions. Uh, one of the survey staff responses was, uh, looked like approximately one third of teachers, I guess this dovetails to the prior question, approximately one third of teacher responses or staff responses were uh, still being concerned about returning uh, in spite of all precautions being taken. Um, is there a chance that for some classes, for example, my child will be going to third grade, uh, a teacher will not be present in the classroom? Will, will some teachers be unwilling to teach from the classroom? Um, fair question. Uh, right now, um, with 20 some percent, you know, just over 20% of families preferring uh, or planning to not send their child to school, and us having roughly 30% of staff having concerns. We feel like um, we can bridge that 10% gap um, and uh, uh, try to have that win-win solution where um, we can uh, um, provide the distance learning for those who want it, um, staff and students both, and um, perhaps uh, you know make the uh, make the case for the 10% of staff that may prefer distance learning, uh, but may not require it, we can um, convince them that that the workplace is a safe one. We're following all the district, I mean, the county health officers criteria, and that, um, you know, uh, showing them with our uh, custodial protocols and custodial staff that um, you know, they uh, can come back to work uh, safely. So I'm optimistic, uh, you know, maybe that's easy for me to say um, because it'll be a different superintendent executing this in the fall, but I, I truly do believe um, wholeheartedly in our staff. And I, and I do think that we'll be, um, we'll be able to um, be there uh, and provide an in-person program for the families that want it. Uh, Pam? Uh, Tina Falaktu. Hello, everybody. This is actually uh, Father Tom Falaktu. Hi, Father Tom. <laughs> Tina's with me as well. Uh, we have several questions. Um, where to start? I'm going to ask uh, the one that's most on my mind is I'm very concerned about my young children wearing a mask all day long. I wanted. I would really like to know what the health. What would happen? In, what, what the ramifications would be for them wearing a mask all day long for their health, long-term. Um, we also have, we're on a group text with a bunch of friends of ours that couldn't get into this meeting, so they've sent us some questions. I don't know how many you'll get to, but I'm just gonna ask two more. Uh, what chemicals will be used to clean and how often will they be cleaning? Is it the same chemicals they've been using now? Will they be coming in and spraying things down? How will it, what will the cleaning be look like? And will teachers and students also be responsible for cleaning as well? or will there be a staff um, coming every day to sanitize? And then if we choose the distance learning option, and then halfway through the year, uh, the health officials lift all the regulations, will our children return back to school? And if we choose the at home, the true distance learning, will they definitely go back to Cipriani or will they now be moved to a different school? But, but also I wanna know, Dr. Milliken, if, yeah. if we choose distance learning for this year, 
And then the next year, so 2021 to 2022, we're back to normal. Um, are we still going to be given a spot or because we chose distance learning, you know, it doesn't go straight back? You know, how does that all work? Yeah, we don't expect people to give up their space at their school okay. um, when they go to distance learning. Um, so, uh, except you, you said the Philoctus definitely would have to give up their spot, I think. Um, thanks, Jim. Uh, no, uh, um, uh, the expectation is that um, uh, you're not giving up your spot at your school when you go to distance learning. With regard to the stamina of younger students being able to wear a mask or a face covering all day, uh, there is an expectation that they would get breaks uh, to take off those masks for sure. Um, I can't speak to the, the health ramifications long term. But I do know that we talked about, you know, going outdoors, having some more space between the kids, maybe taking off the masks and, and, and doing that on a regular basis. Um, we think that, um, you know, outdoor classroom uh, setups might allow for uh, less mask wearing. Um, you would also ask for chemicals. Um, we, there, California is very progressive when it comes to um, uh, regulating that. So we're going to be following um, state and county guidance there. We're not going off and, and, and buying our own uh, materials there. We expect to have the large majority of uh, the disinfecting of the classroom being done by our custodial staff. Students are going to be washing their own hands. Um, teachers guiding them on that and, and washing their own hands. But uh, the expectation is that this disinfecting is done by trained custodial staff. Um, I think we hit most of it, but we'll try to uh, um, make sure we include that in the FAQ. And for those folks who weren't able to join, they can stream um, by following um, on the brssd.org um, link to YouTube. Uh, Pam, next comment. Uh, David Pickett. Hi, uh, can you guys hear me now? Yes, we yes. can. Awesome. So uh, my question is kind of from the perspective of a teacher and a parent. Um, I've got a student uh, that will be coming to Ralston as a sixth grader next year. Um, and I was wondering how we get past a couple challenges. Um, the first one being placement, um, particular for English and math at Ralston, because uh, we've got a real lack of data from the spring. Um, and then the other challenge is these requirements like um, taking you know, 550 kids temperature in the morning before school starts, keeping them in the classroom at, uh, at lunchtime. You know, how do we do that without hiring additional staff? Because obviously we don't have the money to do that. Um, teachers need a lunch break and you know, students got to be supervised. So just those are kind of the two questions. How do we deal with those sort of challenges? Yeah. Um, to be honest, I don't know if we're going to be able to do advanced English uh, as we had planned for seventh and eighth grade. Uh, the placement data that we have for math um, is fairly um, uh, fairly reliable in terms of its predictive ability and placing kids for the for the last year. Uh, Chingpei, what was the name of that assessment that we had for everybody in fifth grade? We used the Inspect assessment published by Key Data Systems, which has validity and reliability testing from thousands of students. Um, we've looked at the data. The, the, we've actually loosened the restriction a little. Every child who has a four or five on the inspect is being placed into advanced standing math for sixth grade. Whereas in the past, some students who scored a four also didn't score high enough on one of the other metrics and so wouldn't be allowed in. So Perfect. we made it Thanks. such a predictable then, factor and I, I feel like we have good strong numbers. Great. And David's other question was uh, the kids staying in the room all day long. Uh, we would expect that we would have um, basically blocked off areas or, or demarcated uh, sectors of the blacktop and field for kids to take uh, recess and lunch. We would expect them to stay in their groups, but by staggering lunches, we could make sure everyone had time and space to, to play and get some fresh air and eat lunch outdoors. Um, and not have to stay in their class all day long. Uh, Pam, next. So I think another question was just temperature checks also. Oh yeah, we plan to um, get a lot of uh, no contact thermometers. And so the logistics of exactly how we would um, 
take the temperature of the teacher and the students. Um, we have yet to work out, but we will need um, a lot of thermometers. Uh, I apologize if I say this incorrectly. Uh, to Quan. Hi. Hey, Sue. Uh, no, this is a Hanson Quan. Um, okay. My question is, I have a going to be a fourth grade uh, in Cipriani, and then a seventh grade going to Ralston, and we're going to do this. Uh, you know, two days and three days, would it be able to coordinate them or Cipriani will have a different kind of setup versus Ralston will have a different kind of setup? Well, um, Ralston is going to have a different kind of setup, but it's still going to be the AB. So whatever we do for the alternating, we plan to do it top to bottom district wide. So if you do have a student in one of the, the six elementaries and a student at Ralston, um, if we are following that rough metric of alphabet by last name, uh, we would be trying to keep families together across different schools. Um, and that's the only challenge is if we get too cute with pairing up um, friends and, and, and changing that and letting the seven principals have a free hand there, then we potentially lose the consistency of families being grouped together across the elementary and the secondary. But yeah, that's what we're trying to do is, is keep those families together across the two different schools. Pam? Uh, Diana. Yes, um, I wanted to know what concrete plans do you have to provide training for teachers? Oh, sorry, now, now, now I'm unmuted. No, you're, you're, we heard you. Uh, concrete okay. plans for training teachers. Um, yes. Was that your complete question or did you have more? No, no. Um, in this new environment, right? So for example, um, if we then, you know, for example, right now we're going to do a condensed time uh, for teaching um, the, the, the students. Um, and then if things change, the possible remote teaching again, right? Correct. Um, what plans do we have to train the teachers? teachers? Because we've had a, a very... Uh, from, from our experience, we have a, a child at Nesbitt and one at Ralston, and the, uh, the remote teaching was very, very spotty. Um, you know, the Nesbitt teacher's teacher was very good. Um, a couple of teachers at Ralston were good, but, you know, it, it was just very spotty. So what, what, what plans, what concrete plans do you have for training them across the board? We're, um, we typically offer optional uh, training over the summer. Um, we typically uh, have required training for everyone immediately before the start of the school year. And we pushed forward our staff development day in the fall. Uh, Pei, it's normally in October and this year it's gonna be in September. Yep, uh, additionally, the teachers are going to be getting email from me tomorrow with a variety of summer training options that uh, support distance learning uh, using tech tools. Um, most specifically, rather than our normal summer trainings that offer more um, curriculum-based trainings. We're looking more at pedagogical skills this summer. But I do want everyone to know that, you know, as a result of the budget cuts, we did uh, basically cut out our professional development budget for the district. And we're uh, um, replacing it with uh, a school force donation. Uh, currently, that donation stands at about $140,000 or $150,000 projected for next year. But if people do donate more, we can do more. So um, our professional development, unfortunately, is constrained somewhat by resources. And so donations to School Force can help us with that. Pam? Uh, Michael, can I comment real quick? Um, sure. So, uh, you know, part of the reason we're putting out some of the board policies we are is an expectation not only of what good distance learning looks like, what uh, good working from home looks like, but an expectation that the district works closely with our staff to make that happen and provide them with the, both the training resources, physical resources, and intellectual resources to do a good job, right? So it's a two-way street there. Um, it's not that we put all the onus on the teachers, and so we really do bear the burden both ways to make sure that uh, we do a good job for the kids. Thanks, Jim. Um, Pam. 
Manal Al Elgandar. Elgandor. Hi, thanks. So you kind of touched on this uh, um, in regards to the kids kind of getting to go out onto the playground or something to, for, to have lunch outdoors or to be able to kind of move a little bit. So if they do an A group one day and a B group a separate day, will they be at school the full six hours or will they be kind of short in days? Because um, I think they're gonna have a lot less outdoor time or, you know, extra curriculum. Right. right. Um, the short answer is that um, because those teachers, um, at least in grades four through eight, normally um, a teacher gets time to plan lessons, um, grade papers, uh, prepare for the next day. That's called prep time. Normally teachers get their prep time um, baked into the uh, school day when another specialist teacher is teaching their students. But if we can't have those specialists uh, teaching um, uh, and mixing with the different groups, and we're doing that remotely, then the teacher doesn't get relieved um, of their teaching to get that prep time. And so in grades K through two, we have an earlier release time. The students go home earlier because the afternoon, the extra 45 minutes at the end of the day is the teacher's prep time. And then in fourth grade and above, they have a longer day, but that's because the prep time is, is, is into the school day. So what we're really looking at is everyone having um, a second day, a second grade type of schedule where either you're starting 45 minutes late or you're ending 45 minutes early. So for the most part, yes, it'll be a full school day um, with an asterisk because um, students may start a little bit late or end a little bit early. And that's why it'll be important for us to coordinate closely with childcare. Pam? Jen Vernich. Yeah, Vernich. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Jen. Hey. Um, so I was looking at the Ralston models, and um, both option two and three are the blended ones. And it they both look like the kid would only be doing two subjects for a whole quarter. Is that correct? And is that I think healthy? Right now we're just, I think right now we're looking at three subjects per quarter because um, I don't know that we're going to be able to pull off two. Oh, Jen, have Jen stay on if you don't mind. She wasn't finished. I interrupted. Um, uh, so Jen, just a quick answer is right now at Ralston, we're looking at three classes and each period would be 90 minutes. So three 90 minute periods um, for the first quarter and three different 90 minute periods for the second quarter. But I interrupted, please please finish. Oh, no, that, that was three is better just because I know as kids get older, um, if they hate one subject and now they have only two or three and they really hate one of them, um, it turns them off to school for potentially 45 days. Um, and when would you uh, present uh, what the three would look like, how it would be divided? Uh, right now, our best thinking is that it would be two core subjects and one elective. And so first quarter, two core subjects, one elective. A core subject is math, English, social studies, science. Um, the electives, um, I think most people are familiar with. Um, and right now, our current thinking is PE done remotely um, at Ralston. Uh, Pam, next. Sandra Nim. Good evening. Um, thank you for all the answers you already provided tonight. Um, one of my children really had a hard time with remote learning, um, despite an amazing teacher who tried one on one with, with him and did everything she could. Um, he's now really behind but he loves all the little games uh, that are learning online. Could, could some of us uh, as parents have access to Clever and all those uh, tools, online tools over the summer so we can actually try to catch up a bit and do a little bit every day so he's not too much behind? You will have access to Clever throughout the summer. Um, at some point in August, we will have to turn it off because we have to create the new rosters with the new teachers and students. But we are delaying that as much as possible so that families can access 
all of our, our subscriptions throughout the summer. Um, Ching Pei, just a, a question that I had. Of course, all our kids turned in their Chromebooks uh, today and presumably tomorrow. Um, how do they get into the clever sites, uh, et cetera, and all those resources? Ah, that's a good question. I, I can send another one out. They just need to go to clever.brssd.org and they'll log in with um, their, their, their school accounts. And everybody knows them. Um, the kids who, even if they turned in their Chromebooks at K12, they have the QR codes. And if they need help, Jerome and I can help with that technical assistance. Um, we did have some families keep their Chromebooks over the summers because they indicated need. Pam? Smith? Yes, I just wanted to follow um, a follow up question regarding the at Ralston, the two courses and one elective. So does that mean like for they would, for example, have math only the first semester and then no more math for the entire year? And does that how does that mean that they don't get the full education for that year? Um, you know, they don't, they don't get a full year of math, a full year of English, a full year of social studies. So, are, 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 or will there be some distance learning on the off, you know, on the off, um, off semesters that they don't actually have math? Right. So the, the short answer is if you got math quarter one, you would get math again quarter three. Or if you got English quarter two, you would get English again quarter four. And so the idea would be that you would learn a semester's worth of math in a quarter. And then on the back half of the year, you would learn a semester's worth of math in a quarter. Now I want to be set realistic expectations. We don't think that for one quarter, we can send students to school every other day for a 90 minute period of math and have them learn a semester's worth of math. So we are expecting students, we're going to have to prioritize the curriculum and focus on the two thirds of the curriculum that we think is most important and really make sure that we teach that well. We don't know that we're gonna be able to teach everything we, we normally would. Pam? Uh, last question, Kylie Stancil. Yes, hi, sorry, me again. Um, first, I do wanna give a shout out to the third grade uh, learning team at Nesbitt. They did an amazing job. They were really on it and jumped right into the distance learning. So shout out to them. But um, I wanted to know, when will you uh, be making your decision as to whether or not we're gonna do the uh, weekly grouping, the daily grouping or the morning and afternoon grouping? Uh, good question. Um, probably not morning and afternoon if anybody's making plans already. Uh, and, uh, but you know, somewhere in between daily and weekly. And um, we hope to make that decision as early as a week from today um, at next week's board meeting on June 18. Um, but if we need more time, it may go to the end of the month. But um, the goal is um, this month in June, um, and um, if things go smoothly, uh, the end of next week. Um, so uh, um, it's nine o'clock. Uh, Pam, you said last question. I'm, in, I'm inclined to sort of take you up on that. Yeah, I just wanted to, there has been a few questions in the Q&A about janitorial services, cleaning of the classrooms, bathrooms. Uh, I don't think that we've touched on that, so we might want to touch on that if we have a moment. Yes, yeah, so um, one of the advantages of every other day or every other week is it gives our custodial team time to, to clean the school and disinfect classrooms and bathrooms and high touch surfaces um, in the afternoon and evening. Um, we uh, will be getting cleaning protocols that are very detailed from the county. We're using um, a version of those now because we do have our um, schools cleaned uh, regularly, at least the front offices and the common areas um, for our teachers to use our schools um, over the last month or two. And um, so we'll be following the county um, cleaning protocols. And then also we will be assigning 
uh, classrooms or groups of classrooms to specific bathrooms to try to make sure that we don't have everybody uh, going to use uh, different bathrooms. So those um, cleaning protocols will be public. Uh, they'll be uh, from the county to the schools and school districts. We'll be happy to, uh, to share those. And um, we do take that very seriously. And as I mentioned, that was feedback we were getting back from staff. Um, one thing as we wrap up, maybe we can uh, go around the panel and um, let each board member make a concluding thought and then we can call it a night. I'll start if that's okay. Um, just, you know, our, our board and, and our district team has spent a lot of time, um, as you can see, thinking about these issues, um, not just looking at what the county framework is, but looking at what other countries are doing, what other states are doing, what our surrounding districts are doing. I know in the Q&A there was a question about, um, are we trying to align with Carlmont? Um, we've been following what Sequoia Union High School District is doing, as well as other districts in the area. Um, so we've spent a lot of time thinking about this. We appreciate the enormous amount of um, attendees that we had on tonight's town hall, and we appreciate all the input um, at the advisory committee uh, as well. Um, I just wanna say for, from my perspective um, in all the research and, and the things that I've been following, and, and I shared this at our last board meeting, to me, there, there are a few principles or guide uh, posts that I keep in mind. I think we, number one, have to take the input of all of our stakeholders. Um, we've had you know, a survey, a robust survey, um, this town hall meeting, we've got the advisory committee, those sorts of opportunities are really important. I think um, what's been shared tonight as well is a need for flexibility. We could go um, certainly back into shelter in place. So we need to create plans that allow a seamless uh, transition between even if we have some on campus that we're able to go back and, and have a high quality educational program. Um, third, I, I think that we have to treat our, our sites um, equitably. And that's an issue that was also brought up. I, I think Amy brought it up in, in particular. It's our teachers have brought it up. And equity is not just by the numbers, it's by the need. Um, I think fourth, we have to coordinate with our surrounding districts, um, particularly Sequoia, because a lot of our students as we saw from the survey, we've got 15% of families, and that's just the ones who responded, um, who have students that are in our high school district. Um, and I think the most important thing, which came up um, indirectly in, in all of our discussion tonight, was to keep students at the center of our decision making. And so for me, those are the guiding principles um, that I plan to keep in mind for our next board meeting and um, our decision making moving forward. Well, I'll mention a few words. I, I really appreciate the uh, large number of attendees tonight, and it sounds like there, we capped out at 500 and, and there were folks that, who couldn't get on. Uh, but I do encourage everyone to let their friends know that this uh, town hall is available for viewing as well. So um, everyone can view the recording, and if things or questions pop up, please feel free to email the board and the superintendent so that we understand what additional questions there are. Um, and I know there's also a lot of Q&A that we didn't get to. So we will definitely take a look at that. And hopefully the district will be able to put together the, the FAQs and, and get that out to everyone. Because uh, we want to make sure that we're hearing a, a broad cross section of input um, because uh, I, I was, there's different, also different groups within the task force that are focused on different aspects. So there's elementary education, there's a group focused on the secondary, which would be the middle school population, another that's focused on the uh, technology and distance learning. Um, there's also a child care group and a safety group. Um, so there's different folks focused on different things. So getting as uh, broad of an input as possible, that input can be shared with each of the focus groups. 
to dive deeper into solutions. And that's part of what's happening with the task force is we're continuing to dive into the next level of detail so that by the time the school board meeting comes around next Thursday, we have a better sense of, of what the logistics might look like and what are the implications of the models that we're considering. So I, I really appreciate everyone's input and, and let's keep the conversation going. I'll add on to what Amy just said. Um, absolutely, I appreciate everyone dialing in. We have over 500 participants, obviously a lot of questions. And um, I want to echo something Michael said earlier. Your input is helping shape our decision making, both for us and the board and for our staff. We are trying our best to keep in touch with what the county is saying, what the county office bed is advising, and what um, different organizations are giving us input. But we also need that input from, from staff and parents, stakeholders as well. And, um, Dr. Malcolm gave the example of uh, input around, and staff input around keeping parents together. And that has uh, been something that we're really taking into consideration. One note I want to add that hasn't already been mentioned, but I know that we've gotten a lot of emails and uh, someone asked the question earlier about how can, how can you help. I want to reiterate, donate to school force. There we are in our, our budget situation and there is a lot of needs um, and if you want to help that is one way to help yeah I think my, my colleagues did a great job at, at summing that up it's it's um, tough to follow them uh, but and and I also want to echo those thoughts about um, you know showing appreciation for everyone who joined this call and provided feedback and sorry we couldn't get to everyone um, there's a lot of questions on there and I think it'll provide a really good FAQ or a good start to one. Um, and I, I also like the fact that, that our community is so involved and so uh, concerned about this and, and willing to step up and help. I think um, with at-home learning, there will be opportunities where we don't have our parents, we, we're not gonna allow them to come, well, the health order is not gonna let us allow them to come on campus, but there will probably be lots of opportunities for them to help remotely. Um, so hopefully we can come up with some uh, good ideas for that. Um, um, unfortunately, there's no perfect solution to this situation. Um, uh, we have some excellent leadership uh, on the team and we have some ex excellent leadership starting out uh, coming in the fall. And, uh, and we're gonna all work together as a team to find the best solution possible given the circumstances. Um, there will have to be some uh, compromises made, um, you know, because of, of the restrictions that we have. Um, our county office of education and the health department both have provided excellent leadership so far all throughout this spring. Um, they acted early when the pandemic hit, and um, um, and I don't I don't want to downplay the loss of of that that we've had so far, but they've done a lot to uh, help the situation. And um, if you look at the statistics for the Bay Area compared to the rest of the country, we're in much better shape. And I think it's due to that county leadership that's, that's helped that. Um, so we're gonna continue um, to follow the recommendations orders. They provide an excellent framework. They also give us some flexibility to do what we need to serve our local community. And we're gonna find the best solutions within those constraints to serve all students for an equitable student achievement. And thank you everyone for your feedback and, and continue to send more. It's great to hear from all stakeholders. Thank you. Yeah, um, being the last person, of course, uh, people have already said a lot of the things that I um, care about and, and also um, feel like are important. The, the one thing I wanna say is thank you to our teachers and staff uh, for really uh, jumping in, uh, you know, in totally unprecedented circumstances to do as good a job um, as we could have expected. This is really like building the airplane in the middle of flight. Um, and there were a lot of unexpected challenges that came along. Um, and I want to say thank you to all the parents um, and staff that are still in it with us, um, working through these problems and how things might be best solved. I, you know, we don't expect that we're going to get to a perfect solution. Um, I, 
I see this as making the best bad uh, choice um, in a lot of ways. Uh, maybe a best bad, a best best suboptimal choice. Um, maybe a better way of saying it, um, because none of the models that we have in front of us is dictated in part by our healthcare concerns are going to be perfect. Um, so we're going to do the best we can to get close to normal as we can with certain restrictions in mind and know that those solutions are not going to be perfect. Um, I think that one of the things I really care about um, is making sure that both our staff, our families, and our students feel like they have a safe and healthy environment to come back to. Um, and that, I can say from experience, was one of the biggest problems that we faced um, in my workplace um, as we move forward. It was just the anxiety of being there. Um, and so, you know, with time, with data, uh, things have certainly become easier. And I expect with time and data that we'll know what the right things are, uh, what's too much to do, what's useful, what's not useful. Um, and that is really our friend here, that um, the experiences that we have collectively uh, can drive our independent decision making locally. Um, and so as long as we're paying attention to um, what, what data suggests is useful and not useful, um, I think we can move through this together as best we can. Um, and one last thing before I get off. Um, this is basically Michael's last hurrah. And I have not seen a superintendent uh, or a leader have to face so many ridiculous challenges uh, over such a short period of time um, and still be positive and just working super hard for the district uh, this whole way through. Um, uh, frankly, uh, I would have checked out by now. Um, and <laughs> he would have been, uh, I think a lot of people would have said, uh, maybe that's understandable in terms of how crazy things been, but he's been a pro the whole way and um, really has been working hard to make sure that the transition goes well. Um, so again, Michael, thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Um, so just so everyone's aware, next steps, uh, 4 p.m. Uh, uh, advisory committee meetings on Wednesday and Monday and Wednesday of next week, a board meeting Thursday of next week. Uh, Ching Pei, thank you for presenting. Jerome Pan, thank you for facilitating. And um, uh, again, folks who want to send us feedback, uh, you can do that at feedback at brssd.org. If you want to email the board, you can do that at board at brssd.org. Thanks so much, and we'll stay in touch. Hope to see you next week. Thank you. Good night. Good night.